Kia ora everyone, welcome back to another episode of Both Sides Now. We're here this week with Dame Jenny Shipley um, up in the uh, be beautiful Northland here in Russell. D Dame Jenny, thank you very much for having us. It's my pleasure. So we'll start off uh, the interview the same way we do with, with, with all mm. the interviews, um, which is what political ideology do you identify with? I'm a, a centre-right, probably a centre-centre-right, as opposed to, you know, well across the spectrum. Uh, I'm a fiscal conservative, but a social liberal. And so it was relatively unusual in the National Party that I was so clearly in those two camps, but that's most certainly where my head and my heart is. Is that something that was sort of a discussion in the National Party? Did you talk about your sort of philosophies or what, you know, e economic or political philosophers that influenced your thinking? I think that you, you come to politics with a full knowledge of the, the values of the party. And, you know, they are long-standing and very clear. And um, what I think is most important, though, is how each generation interprets those. So when I came into politics, it was fresh off the back of the, the 1980s. There was huge change in the National Party. It was literally a passing of the torch to next generations. And uh, there was a lot of debate as to how to bring the values that the, rap the party represented into a contemporary context, but also into a very realistic context, because both the world and New Zealand were in some quite difficult circumstance. So you talk quite a lot about those values and kind of needing to be changed as each generation comes along. You are the first female prime minister. How did you sort of find the sexism in office? And do you think it's kind of got better since when you were around in politics? Well, look, remember that you, you come into leadership as a leader. Uh, and of course, sexism is a real issue. Uh, I experienced it as a young backbencher. I experienced it as a minister. I experienced it as prime minister. But you have to remember that the majority of people who selected me as the leader were men. And so sexism comes in pockets and often from individuals. My experience in politics and leadership is people look to people who can lead and articulate uh, what we need to both say and do and how people will follow. Sexism, however, is um, highly destructive. It was then and it is now, but it was never enough to divert me from my intention. So for me, sexism is something that needs to be dealt with and stared down, but it's never in my full line of sight. When I have to deal with it, I go and deal with it and put it aside and then get on with the job. And I think that's true for women leaders wherever they are, because they have to. Otherwise, they would simply pack their tent and fail. If you wouldn't mind sharing with us, was there any particular sort of examples of sexism that you experienced that stand out? Well, I, I, I'm always reluctant to give... Uh, people airtime here because they're bullies actually. Se sexism is a, a form of gross bullying that's misguided and misogynist no normally in its its origin. Uh, and it's sometimes just stupid. Uh, you know, I, one of the incidents that offended me most, I put up with the, the daily banter. I mean, I had some of the big minds and big voices of both the 80s and 90s, um, uh, Preble, DeClean, Longy, but you could win their respect. They started off trying to demean and degrade you and undermine you. If you stood up to them on the ideas, eventually you won their respect and support. You, you know, you can only deal with it in ways that suit you. But for me, I never gave it airtime, but I always dealt with it and made it clear that that's not the basis on which we should be engaging. And... Um, so it's interesting you say that they were from Labour because I think people traditionally sort of think Labour's more progressive and the sexism didn't happen as much. Do you think it happened everywhere in Parliament when you, you were You go and read the Hansards of what some of the Labour opponents, Michael Cullen, uh, some of the things Michael said to me, you wouldn't get away with, interestingly, today. It, it would not be acceptable. Uh, and the Parliament, I'm always amused with Mallard because uh, what he said as a younger man, he now won't tolerate, uh, which I also... Maybe that's a good example of the shift that as more women are there, the, the norms shift. And I think that's a good thing, but uh, uh, um, it is completely untrue uh, to say that sexism is, is confined to any political party. If anything, myself and Ruth and others were targets uh, because they wanted um, us to, to withdraw. They, we were strong, significant personalities, having to do very large roles it was very new in the parliament to have two women in such large portfolios driving such large reform. Uh, they had just lost a very significant election in the 1990s. And so, you, you know, you have to take the context. So there were wounded pride and can we undermine them and 
I think that inflamed uh, some of their intent, but it was pretty severe. When I was talking to my mum um, about this interview, she said she remembers being a young wom woman and uh, watching a debate, Helen Clark in the first debate, and thinking that was super empowering for her, seeing that there's two uh, female leaders of, of, of the major parties. And at the time, looking around globally, and that just wasn't the case at all, you know, politics globally was just completely dominated by men. Is that something in the moment you sort of felt that was quite empowering for you as well? Not knowing that, I, I, well, I guess knowing that, you know, Helen's a, le a leader as well and, 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 and women are definitely on the oh, of course. rise in politics in and, New Zealand. And it was very rare for women to, to uh, um, their debate to ge degenerate into personal stuff. Yeah. I, I can't think of an instance where, you know, it became, I mean, there was, this was severe debate. It was not, uh, you know, kumbaya. Um, but we were contesting ideas. We weren't trying to undermine individuals. And Helen and I had some massive uh, debates, but we also collaborated on certain things where we knew that we needed to work together uh, in order to yeah. either stop things happening or indeed make things happen. Uh, and that's how the parliament works at its best. So on the flip side of that coin from some of those experiences you talked about just before, were there moments in parliament where you go and have a meal or a drink with some of the opposition uh, <laughs> members and you sort of had, had friendships with, with, with them? It, it, it's interesting, at breakfast, and I don't know what happens now, but in those days, at, at breakfast, everyone mixed up. Mm. And you would sit down with whoever, um, and you know, you would go and often have um, sometimes they'd be very casual discussions. Sometimes they'd be you know, policy issues. Uh, sometimes they would just be fun. But it, by the time the day got underway, often it was then it would then fold more into having to stay with your group and um, mm. get yourselves organised. So there was sort of like starting the day and then work. Uh, Michael Cullen and I always used to swim in the mornings, and you know you're surprisingly civil in the swimming pool, and then literally. Um, yeah. in your roles in the parliament. So you have to differentiate. You're not uncivil in a personal sense, but you are driving your portfolio and contesting ideas. And we were certainly contesting ideas in those era, that era. Um, and they're different. There, there are, there's a difference between acquaintance and friendship too. Some mm -hmm. people just view the opposition as the enemy and they'd never mix. There are others of us, and I was one, where I was very comfortable amongst um, people. Uh, and there are some friend, friendships that develop across lines, and there are many acquaintances, um, and they're different. You know, friends you invite to dinner. Acquaintances <laughs> you'll always greet with a hug and, and shared telephone numbers. And Helen and I, for example, I, you know, I've got a lot of the telephone numbers of the key leaders still, if that's any indication. Mm. But a friendship is a different thing. Tiriana Tuia, I view as a friend. Uh, I admired and respected her journey. I learnt a lot from her. Uh, we shared a lot together and we were able to do some good things. But we, were, we developed a friendship and I view her still um, as an important mm. person. So do you talk about um, <clears throat> kind of like early on about um, the, th the issues you face with being a woman in parliament? Did you ever to get to a moment where you thought, wow, I actually can't do this because I'm a woman? Did that ever sort of... No. You never face that struggle? Well, look, I, I would never encourage women or men to go into Parliament if they don't firstly know what they're getting into. Uh, and be very clear about their, their sense of purpose and intention. So I was raised, you know, I was a leader long before I came to Parliament in many community and public roles. I understand leadership purpose. I understand leadership intent. I joined the National Party for those reasons. I was part of a generation that absolutely knew we had to... Uh, change step. Um, and there was a sense of purpose amongst us uh, from the president of the party down through the, the new leadership group. Uh, so it was never a, an equivocal issue. And our intention was to deliver change. It wasn't about me. It was about what we intended to do. And I, it was very demanding because the um, economic circumstances were very demanding at that time. And New Zealand had a relatively limited set of choices. And we had some big issues we had to call. Um, but no, I never, there were days you just felt crippled with the pressure, but <clears throat> I'd always pick myself up and Burton, who was an incredible support and others, um, uh, no, I never got to the point, this is too much. I was glad to leave, <laughs> but I, you know, I'd had 11 years out of 15 in major leadership roles. And, um, so, you know, I'd done my share by then, but it wasn't a matter of quitting. I had just felt I you know, it was time for new people to pick this up.
There's a sentiment out there in society that um, for career politicians like um, the Prime Minister at the moment, Justin Ardern, and people who are getting into politics younger, that they need some sort of life experience beforehand. You're relatively young getting into politics mm. at, at 35. Is that something you sort of ag agree with that somehow as a career politician or you know you need some sort of significant life experience before going into politics? And in and, and hindsight, do you think that was the right, right age and time for you to go into politics? It was the right age and time for me. Um... And I don't view myself as a career politician. I mm. view, uh, view myself as a recidivist leader <laughs> who happened to serve in a public sense for 15 years. Uh, but I do many, many things, mm. uh, uh, still using my leadership skills and intent. <clears throat> um, I, you know, Bert and I had owned a farm for 15 years and had been trading in our own right. We had made and lost money. We understood how the economy worked. Uh, mm. I had been raised in the uh, Amance. My mm. parents had nurtured us in understanding social condition issues. I didn't view myself as a naive, um, uh, undeveloped leader. And frankly, when I contested that seat, the Ashburton seat at the time, uh, there were many candidates, uh, in the end, five of us. And I had, to, I had to win that seat. I won it on the fourth ballot by only a couple of votes. Now that tells you that the contest of ideas and even getting into the position to stand was uh, robust and important. Uh, I was ready uh, to go into Parliament at that time. Mm. You talk quite a lot about the contest of ideas. Do you think that politics is moving away from the context yes. of ideas and more towards contest of like personalities and much more petty, for want of a better phrase? Well, look, I can only speak for when I was there. You know, there, there was such a, a serious, uh, you know, the, the, the IMF was over our shoulder. We, we literally had debt levels that were limiting, you had to make some big calls. We had to make calls around um, superannuation, for example. I mean, choosing to raise the age of super from 60 to 65 over 10 years is a very demanding policy. But when you looked at the fiscal position and you looked at the social position and you looked at the de demography, it, it had to be dealt with and people were keeping putting it off. I was prepared to carry that argument because it was just a critical argument in terms of where we are now, and someone's going to have to do the next five years because, you know, 65 is, is now a very young retirement age relative to people's mm. longevity. So some of those big, big ideas that, that they had fiscal implications, but they had intergenerational social obligations. They are what I mean, contesting ideas. At the moment, I do worry that uh, the media enjoy the salacious as opposed to the substantive. Mm. I mean, obviously, the substantive issues of our time were pretty salacious. There, there were plenty of headlines for for media. Maybe it is that that uh, it's got cluttered. But look, it's a different time. Social media has changed things for both the media, for politicians, and others. We we didn't poll every you know idea. I mean, <laughs> the, the, the capacity to do that uh, simply wasn't there, and so it had to stand on its merits. Um, I'm not sure. I, I, I mean, obviously, I'm aware how much polling uh, goes on now. But for me, politics is about um, intergenerational equity as opposed to, you know, actual equity. And these are arguments that span many policy ideas and many, many um, complex um, issues. I dis I'm dismayed to some extent by the lack of robust debate. Uh, around some of these big issues. A lot of it's it's um, interest-driven, which is good. You, you do need the activists and you do need the lobbyists. But in the end, it only lands if you can then get leaders across the political spectrum who weigh up these ideas and decide whether the status quo or moving uh, is the right thing to do. And the, that feels like a bit of a hole to me. Uh, at the moment, you, you say intergeneration. Uh, you, you, you say politics is more about intergenerational equity than equity. Uh, no, no, not or, not either or. It has to be both. Right? Can you explain the difference between that and inequality in your in your mind? Well, equality. We need to strive for equality of outcome. It's very easy to say, oh well, everyone starts with an equal opportunity, or, mm. or and and uh, 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 day zero. Theoretically, people are. Uh, uh, equal and have an equal, you can argue that it's up to them or up to the people around them. But in reality, there are many social norms and indicators that, that we know um, distort that very quickly. 
However, governments have to weigh up uh, how to try and solve those problems without undermining the ability to continue to maintain and grow the economy. And then, so one of them is linear and the other is intergenerational, where if we do this now, what will be the impact or the unintended consequences uh, later? If we don't do it now, what will be the unintended consequences later? And what you need in political debate is trying to look at the immediate need yeah. and respond to it. But also in responding to that need, try and weigh up what the consequences of your intervention will be as against not intervening. And these are constant debates. They're being written about, there's new work being written about them, and they'll keep evolving. Inequality, I think, is something young people are relatively passionate about just because in the last couple of years we've seen, um, even though the world uh, has has gone through, you know, to some extent, a bit of economic hardship given COVID, sure. inequality has actually increased the wealthiest people have got, you know, wealthier around the world. In New Zealand, we don't know exactly how much the wealthiest people pay um, as an effective marginal tax rate, but some of the estimates suggest that the wealthiest 1% pay 12%, a 12% 12 effective marginal tax rate, and the rest of society pays around about 17%. Uh, is that something, um, you know, ha have we got it wrong in New Zealand there in terms of inequality as, as that gap continues continues oh, look, to widen? Well, 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 I'm not sure. When you use the word widen, you've got to step back. So I, I came out of a generation where the personal taxation regime was at about 66%, uh, and mm. we didn't have a... a um, we had there was a capital gains tax of sorts in those early days, uh, and gift duty and all sorts of other complexity. But we did not have a consumption tax. We didn't have GST. Uh, in both the Labour and National era, it was decided that you had to shift that so that whoever consumed uh, got taxed as they consumed because mm -hmm. you can't avoid it. Uh, the, the reason why no governments change GST is because you can't avoid it. And so wealthy people who consume far more pay a very large chunk of that tax relative to others. And then the way in which to, to, to uh, try and deal with equity is to then use the social payment structures. And that's where family support in my era uh, came in because we needed to stop the regressive nature of these changes. I, look, I hear debate being had around capital gains, for example. Um, Neither party of the major parties is saying they will change that, although there are mechanisms now that we've effectively got a capital gains tax. Um, in the end, it is up to governments uh, to see where the change should be. I don't think you will see major change in the structure of New Zealand's tax structure. I think you might see adjustments on the margin, thresholds and top rates. Uh, but in the end, you've got to also have people incentivized enough to do the work to invest in the next generation of businesses and people. And so it's always something that governments grapple with and they look at the evidence and they look at the research and they look at opinion uh, and then they make their calls. Mm. There's, um, in, in my first economics le lecture, we were always told that economics is how we allocate scarce resources more efficiently and the role of the government is to sort of let the free market do its thing and then um, tax externalities, so revenue raise, based on the bad stuff in society. That's something we haven't, uh, you know, some people would say that's something we haven't really done, you know, things like a plastic tax, a sugar tax, uh, carbon, nitrates, all the sort of externalities. Was that uh, a, a sort of a notion or, or philosophy that you guys exported, all the well, revenue raising from externalities? Well, as a health minister, I was the one who put all of the branding on cigarettes mm. and put all the tax up and it's continued beyond that. It's a good example of it's the, it's the uh, other taxing, key one. Yeah. taxing things that you think are detrimental to health and um, uh, can make a difference. We use it in ACC with, with vehicles and things. There's, mm. There are a series of places across the economy. They're not in the controversial areas, but most certainly they have been used. Bigger cars pay bigger mm. um, um, penalties in different ways. And um, I think that's a good thing, both at registration and with ACC um, exposure. Risky businesses pay more in ACC than non-risky businesses, but they're not, not the sexy issues. Mm. But, but that principle has been used quite widely uh, in New Zealand's uh, broader economic area. There are certainly areas that will, in the future, uh, be explored further. There's no question. You're seeing mm. it in um, the green policy suite of arguments. I think what has to be debated, though, 
is just theoretically saying, oh, well, it's tax bad stuff. You have to be satisfied that in doing so, it will change the behaviour. Mm. I mean, you, uh, carbon credits, in, in my view, are both a strength and a weakness. I mean, people can pay but still do what they like, and that's not changing the outcome. So while it may make people feel good that in some instances you're taxing bad things, and actually, in actual fact, unless it changes the behaviour, so that unintended consequence has to constantly be looked at to see whether it's the right move. I think the other complexity is that people are very clear about what they don't like and would like it taxed. But you do have to be very careful that you don't create a shift that then creates another massive hole. Mm. I'm desperately worried that we are globally heading for a food shortage. And it, it's not because of um, energy policy or green policy or, or population growth exclusively, but there's potentially a convergence of risk where it may have a far more explosive consequence than we might have anticipated as we go moving things here, not really realizing how quickly people yeah. might shift and what the consequences will be on the other side of that. What, what was your understanding <clears throat> of climate change when, when you were yeah, in office? It's interesting. You know, it, I mean, this is a very good example of how political parties um, need to, uh, so even, uh, you know, conservatism, mm. uh, theoretically a centre-right party will try and conserve the things they value and care about and progress on the things that need to change. Um, the science of, of um, global warming and things, at the time we were in government, were only just beginning to be quantified. We were very lucky to have Simon Upton yeah. in our team, and Simon led a lot of the early uh, research and leadership in New Zealand, and our party adopted a lot of that during that period. There's no question, though, that in the, the, the first part of the 2000s and then the second decade and now the third decade in uh, this era, uh, that's accelerating massively and needing a greater and greater response. Our era probably in the change was around the treaty. So it's interesting that each generation of politician is confronted with something that activism and uh, a demand for change that's clearly justified is in front of you. Mm. And the treaty and treaty settlements and the, the equity and justice around that, it mounted through the 80s and it absolutely crystallized in the late 80s and right through the 90s and required our attention and we exercised leadership in that area and it made huge change, which we're now seeing the benefits of. It's interesting you bring up the treaty settlement. So obviously in kind of the conservative <coughs> side of politics, there's an element of not anti-treaty behaviour, but a lot of lack of understanding. Did you, when you started to make changes um, and bring the treaty settlements, did you kind of get met with much from within the National Party and much kind of backlash around trying to make those changes? Well, of course there was, there was what's all this about. But, but that's true with social policy and fiscal policy and, and everything. It's a, you know, you have to help people um, to understand what they don't know. For politicians, they have to learn what they don't know in order to be able to then respond. You, you would have been brain dead if you couldn't have understood in the late 80s and 90s um, that the treaty uh, and the call to honour the treaty had to be responded to because the justice associated with the call was undeniable. And um, a number of us were absolutely determined to lead in that space. So people like me, I was one of the main ministers during the Naitahu um, settlement. It took seven years. Um, lots of my constituents, the land ownership issue. But look, you just had to explain over and over again. Go back and look at the facts. They're only asking for one and a half percent of the value of the land they lost. Would you accept that? I mean, it took a lot of political explanation, uh, but it was a matter of leadership. And it wasn't a matter of, do you like this or not? We're going to do this. And Jim Bolger led extremely well, as did Doug Graham, during that period. And a lot of us were working in behind the scenes and took over that work subsequently. The, by the way, the National Party has done far more in settling the treaty than the Labour Party over the last 35 years. There's no question about that. And, and so it's not a matter of politics, it's a matter of what's right. 
So did you talk about this leadership and the ability to <coughs> just say this is this is what's right and we're going to do it? Do you think we're lacking that a bit nowadays? A classic example is um, just Sundar Ardern and the capital gains tax. Do you, tax. do you think we sort of lack the ability to just say this is what's best for New Zealanders so we're just going to do it? Well, it depends on your view. I mean, she may genuinely think that a capital gains tax is wrong. I, I don't know what was in her mind when she said, not on my watch. Mm. And sometimes it's a political response and sometimes it's a substantive response. There are people who say capital gains tax is a, is a completely um, uh, wrong thing to do in the way in which the economy and people make their decisions. There are others who say it's absolutely critical. Uh, and I don't comment on, as I said to you, on <laughs> current leaders and their yeah. calls because I don't know what was in their mind uh, when they made that call. J Jim Bold just <coughs> come out in uh, support of capital gains tax. Were, was that a conversation within the National Party at the time? Were people uh, agreeing and disagreeing on issues like capital gains tax? And how did you reconcile those decisions amongst, amongst we, the party? We didn't have a major debate. Uh, we, we abolished mm. capital gains um, during the early period. Um, at that stage, because the tax structure had altered very dramatically, we had shifted from income tax to a mix of income and, and uh, goods and services. And so we wanted to let that have its run and see how behaviours occurred. And also the business taxation structure had altered dramatically. Our tax date went up, not down. You know, when we bought the capital, uh, the um, personal tax rates down from 66 to 33, the overall income the government was gathering increased. And what it tells you is people, if they think it's unfair, will go to extraordinary steps to avoid, or mm. evade, should I say. Uh, if people think taxation is reasonable, then they don't mind paying their share. And again, every government has to make the call on whether they think they've got the components and the levels right. Um, I'm not convinced the capital gains tax will be a panacea, but the countries that have introduced capital gains tax, for example, still have housing cycles that are exactly the same as we're experiencing in New Zealand. So again, while it may sound like it's somehow rather morally fair, if that makes sense, uh, I would always want to look at the facts. What are the facts? What are the facts if you make this intervention? Uh, the intended and unintended consequences. And I'm not close enough to the detailed data to have formed a view on it. So I'm, I'm at this yeah. stage, if you ask me, mm. I'm not convinced. So, so you talk about unintended consequences. Obviously, you were Minister of Social Welfare at the time, Mother of All Budgets, um, and they cut benefits by quite a lot. In hindsight, do you think you got that decision right? Of course. Were, were there, like some of those big decisions at the time, um, you, you mentioned you were relatively fiscally constrained. Um, w w were there decisions like that where you would have liked to have been more progressive or more of a reformist and made some big social changes, but because you were so fiscally constrained, you weren't able to? Well, we actually did make some very significant changes. I mean, people often use slogans, and the mother of all budgets is, is obviously one of them. Uh, and you, you talk about benefits. and the, I mean, benefit payments at that time were ahead of what people were earning. And if you get the incentives to the point that people are saying, I'm better on welfare than in work, you've got a major problem on your hands. And that most certainly was the, the circumstance. I mean, the, we, we did the work. This was the substantive analysis. So it, it is quite correct that we changed the benefit structure and there were some base benefits that were cut and then there were other incentives that were put in place. So, for example, we, we wanted, we did a study on domestic purposes benefit, of, you know, as we were building up to work all this stuff out. And there, are, uh, there were three groups within uh, the domestic purposes benefit profile. Uh, the first were people who were really always going to need support. They, for a range of reasons, had not been educated. Uh, they needed absolutely the core structure. The, the next third needed support to study, and the third third were transitional. You know, their relationship had broken down. They needed short-term support to make, move on. We introduced in the mother of all budgets, to quote yourself, um, <laughs> a JET, the JET program. Now, and we also introduced OSCAR, the after-school care program, uh, because we knew that in order to get people, if they wished to move into work, and we were trying to get them to move into work, because our unemployment rates were very high, 12%. You know, this is not a 3.5%. This is a very large portion of our people, and we needed to get them to train, so we paid them to have their children looked after while they studied. And we paid for the children to go to after-school care in order to make that transition. So those things are not referred to mm. often, but again, it, it, it's always more complex than the slogans. And we did what we could with the money, but we moved some of it around. 
we said, look, we can't just keep doing without a view on the outcomes. Um, we need to look at what, whether we can incentivize. And, it, it, you know, people use the words carrot and stick. And there's always a combination of how do you get, how do you be fair and include people, but also encourage them to move when they can in, back into work so that uh, we get the, the circular economy structurally functional. Uh, and we put a lot of work into that. Um, after, after the cutting of the welfare payments, uh, you've mentioned before that uh, you, I guess like all politicians, high-level politicians, have been the victim of some sort of personal attacks. And you know, it's, it's become even possibly more prevalent now with, with Facebook and social media, people being able to say all sorts of things about politicians. Is, um, is that something that you think is, you know, on the, is much worse now than it was when you were it's in government? Different. And it's different. I, I was under constant surveillance. Uh, and I don't mean just a DPS and crew. Yeah. Um, actually, from very early on as a minister, uh, both as welfare and health minister, uh, because of the degree of threats that I got. Uh, and they were serious. Yeah. And um, the intelligence that the police had at the time was nothing like the intelligence system that they can track calls and abuse and, and um, threats, uh, some of which were very, very specific. Um, and again, it's a little like the bullying. You, you know, you have to decide. I mean, it... it it's interesting, it, it didn't stop me focusing on my role, but you certainly are very aware of the impact on your family, on my mother, on my husband, and particularly our children, uh, or, who were very young, you know, at that time. And I'm very interested to see some people who were extremely um, prominent in uh, those movements then, uh, both the abuse and the threats uh, and so on, uh, now very critical if they become the subject of them themselves. Um, and there were people, uh, you know, who most certainly were in that category. You mentioned that you were um, concerned for your children. How did you find being a mum in Parliament? Because obviously that's something that wasn't probably that common when you were involved in Parliament and it's still not that common today. How did you find that Oh, experience? it's common today. I, I think we're very lucky. But we have only had a small group of women in the Parliament, but the Parliament did change. Well, it started to change then. Um, Ruth was the first mum to be breastfeeding a baby in, in Parliament, and her battle was to even get somewhere to do it privately. <laughs> now that's changed a lot. There's creches, and, and um, I, certainly when I was minister, we insisted that a creche be put uh, in the Treasury and then in the Parliament so that women in the inner city, in those days they sort of had arguments that you couldn't put them in, in the city areas. But anyway, they were battles that had to be fought in order for women who were professional women, not only in politics, but in other key leadership roles, that it was possible for them to be a mother and highly successful and lead in their competencies. Uh, and those battles were fought and won. I, I, I think the parliament was diverse then. I mean, Helen made her choice around family. I made my choice. And I think New Zealand is lucky to have had three women leaders, all of whom have made their own choices. It's not an either or. And the media were disgraceful in that era where they, they wanted to make that a debate. I mean, I think women bring their own individuality and their personal choices to their lives and to parliament. Uh, it's easier now because the support network and structure and standing orders and timing, I mean, the timing of the parliament is moderated I began insisting that we have school holidays as a part of breaks. And those early days, you know, the old men, you know, what's all this about? Why do we need to change the parliament? And it went till late on Thursdays. Now we get families home by, you know, six o'clock on Thursdays or whatever it is. These are big changes around an inclusive, family-friendly, representative, house of representatives. It's much more balanced than it was. So as you say, we've had three female leaders now. A lot of people say, and my social <coughs> science teacher in year nine, year 9 said this to me, he said, oh, well, Dame Jenny Shipley was our first female prime minister, but the Right Honourable Helen Clark was our first elected prime minister. Do you think that's kind of degrading to what you achieved by being the first female prime minister? Well, why would they say that? I mean, um, <laughs> it tells you more about them than me. I mean, the facts are I was the first prime minister uh, who was a woman in New Zealand. And New Zealand's electoral system chooses parties who choose their leaders. Uh, so those are the facts. And if others want to argue differently, that's up to them. The facts are 
that we don't elect prime ministers, we elect parties, and that's that. One of the uh, biggest decisions you're involved in that um, is rel relatively relevant for young people today and feels like the conversation is being somewhat revisited is the lowering of the alcohol mm. age. There's many different um, uh, health-based and you know social-based mm. arguments to, to e each side, one of which is... Um, the sort of you know the, the science behind uh, the fact that alcohol is increased you know more damaging for young people brains not fully developed for mm. women until uh, or girls until 23 and for men 25 was that sort of front of mind when you were making that d decision at the time and, and and how evolved was that science well the science the science was developed but not not as far as it is now but but it was certainly i had all of the health sector data i had mm. been health minister from 93 to 96 I'd been transport minister from 96 to 97, and that was relevant insofar as we had to have a structure where young people could be held to account, license holders could be held to account, and um, people selling mm. liquor. And so the introduction of the, I, I oversaw the introduction of the, the photograph driver's license, which was a critical element in a number of social reforms of which my considering the alcohol age uh, limit was one. The, the, uh, two or three facts. I mean, young people's drinking has gone down, not up. Yeah. So, and that's a fact. The, the science right now went up slightly in the early, nine, uh, the early 2000s, uh, but it's tracked steadily down. And I think that's important. One of the things we hope to achieve was that um, the, broad, the, the, the ways in which alcohol was consumed, remember that at the time, there were a lot of large hotels. This was like a swinging, swaying environment where people would go and drink excessively, often illegally. And yeah. the license holders weren't under pressure to create the cafe culture. My change and the vision around the parliament, by the way, it was not just me. It was the fact that I supported and promoted it was extremely important. There's yeah. no question. But the parliament itself, across the parliament, decided on balance that it was the time to make that change. And there was a suite of changes, some of which I didn't support. I didn't support putting it into supermarkets. Yeah. I think it normalizes liquor consumption. And if there was one thing I'd change now, it would be to get it out of supermarkets and make it a purposeful, licensed operator who could be held very specifically to account uh, to change. I think there will be a further review. And this is a bit like tax policy. You know, you change one thing, People respond, and and the policy evolves. We've had one royal commission in about 2010, I think, and they haven't done anything with it. Um, I would put on the record recently that I thought it was time again for them to review, but I certainly don't support the changing of the age. I, I think you've got to really look at who is drinking and why they're drinking and see if you can deal with the underlying issues. I don't believe in making young people criminals uh, for just socialising, and I hear people wanting to let younger people vote even younger than 18. I mean, surely we're not going to go and um, uh, uh, reduce the drinking age. What I do support is if a licence holder is selling alcohol to an, ebri an inebriated teenager or, or young person, they should lose their licence. And so the policing of the existing law is actually a major issue around whether they are doing enough to see that the the social context in which we were trying to see that drinking could occur safely has been achieved. And I think there are some things where further policing investment might make actually a difference to the outcome. But no, I wouldn't change the age, but there are matters that really do need to be debated around liquor, just as there is every 10 or 15 years, I think it's automatically going to be a question that should be looked at. It's interesting, one of the debates that's starting to come up around liquor um, licensing and promotion of it is sports advertising. Do you think that's Definitely a bit of an issue? It's, they are abusing that. That was not our intention, that you could make placements of liquor in highly attractive settings to try and normalise it. That was not our intention, and it most definitely should be dealt with. I, I completely and utterly uh, support uh, making that far more restricted than it is now. 
Yeah, I, I've I studied in the States where obviously the alcohol age is 21 and also in New Zealand have been in a hall both in the States and New Zealand. <laughs> um, and I guess there's, there's probably still as much of a binge drinking culture in both places. Uh, for me, it was just one of the key differences was it wasn't sort of three nights a week like in, in New Zealand in the States because you can't drink in the halls. You've got to be off uni. Um, and I guess having the age um, having the age increase in New Zealand uh, or, or overseas allows you know them to ban alcohol from different areas, which you know might uh, reduce consumption. They, they can ban alcohol from different areas now, mm. and I, um, that's my point. I think you've got to look at the context in which alcohol is consumed and where you tolerate it, um, and be much more strict. I don't think that the the things that we tried to create in terms of context are being exercised as fully as I would like to see them. And I, I, But again, we need to do the research properly before we jump to a, a conclusion here. I very much support an intelligent review, and I personally, when I say intelligent, I think rather than a reactionary dumping of a series of ideas that needs to be put in a white paper, needs to be given yeah. to the public health experts and to the next generation and to others and really thought through and then brought through into legislative change, which... I think then stops um, the conscience vote getting all huffy and puffy and running away with it. It would be more science-driven, mm. socially informed-driven, and um, the consequences would be more considered, I think. Is that something you generally feel like we've possibly done too much of, sort of conscience, um, conscience policy-making rather than uh, you know, an in-depth scientific process? I've, I heard... At one point uh, in, in New Zealand, 90% of policies were sort of an MP had an idea and sort of got it through, and only 10% actually came from scientific literature or out, out of reports. Is, is that a balance you think we've got right in New Zealand? Or? No, I, look, I, I don't know who would say that. Um, in my experience, in a lot of the big change that we brought through, you, you have access to a large amount of free and frank advice, some of which is science-driven. Yeah. Um, and there is there are many forms of analysis that a political leader needs to both have access to and take into account. I think we've seen a very good example through the pandemic of science-led public policy. Yeah. Uh, but in the end, it's, it's you know, the judgment has to be exercised by political leaders. I mean, I think there'll be a lot of review of that around lives and livelihoods. You know, saving lives is important and it's science-driven. But what impact does that have on livelihoods? And governments can only govern where there is a social license to do so. In other words, where the people will tolerate be being told what to do. And we've seen some flashpoints in recent months where it's not to do with the left or the right. It's very widespread of people for one reason or another um, feeling that, um, you know, what's the government telling me? They, they feel that the government's got too far in. Now, the Public Health Act is very important and, in my opinion, must be used in these circumstances, but whoever is in government has to weigh this thing up. I want to come back to conscience, though. Yeah. Conscience votes are very rare in the New Zealand Parliament, and they're usually only used around those things that historically have been a matter of conscience, the liquor and abortion law and um, birth control and, and some of these things. People often misunderstand the value of the conscience. Um, I mean, within any political party, there are people for and against things. And uh, when you allow the parliament to be a genuinely representative body on these complex issues, lifting the whip, so the national whip and the labor whip are generally lifted on those things, and people are told to inform themselves, read the legislation and listen to the debate. <laughs> and once they are changed, mm. in my opinion, once a conscience vote is taken, whether you're for or against it, you need to shut your mouth and open your eyes because the parliament has decided either not to move or to move. And, um, you know, I think that's the value of the conscience vote. And it should be then, it is law, just like any whipped law is passed. And it is law. Um, these are important steps. Mm. Um, I think something that... <coughs> Something that we're, uh, Finn and I are both keen to kind of hear about. Obviously, you became Prime Minister not through the most conventional way. Um, if you're able to kind of talk through, I guess, young people probably aren't that aware of how you became Prime Minister mm -hmm. and the decision to roll um, Jim Bolger. Would you mind giving us kind of a bit of an explanation of why you decided to do that and sort of so we can kind of understand and mm. know what was going on at the time? Well, the, your language is not language <laughs> I would use. I mean, uh, leadership's, uh, leadership changes. Helen 
changed within a cycle I did and so on. Uh, and these are, uh, you know, uh, when you change a letter, you can use the language of roll or coup or yeah. whatever you like. Um, you have to step back and parties choose their leaders. And in our case, the caucus has the exclusive right to choose its leader. And it does so in a, in a very open and proper way. Um, and you are that leader until you lose the confidence of your caucus. Over many months after the 1996 election, or oh, well, to be fair, even before the 1996 election, there was a lot of commentary of uh, initially, oh, she'll never be prime minister because she's been given social welfare, and then, oh, she'll never be prime minister because she's given health. And these were portfolios viewed as poisonous and, and, <laughs> yeah. and, and so on. But leadership's leadership. And uh, I guess the question of, of how your peers view both the current leader and potential future leaders, it's always a dynamic. In every political party, there are multiple people who think they should be prime minister, <laughs> believe me. Um, I, I didn't set out as a child or anything else to be a prime minister. I, as I said, I was raised to be a leader full stop in, in my everyday life. Um, my peers began uh, 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 quite soon after the 96 election saying, um, this will have to be dealt with. Uh, and it, you know, I said no initially. Uh, Jim knew this was a pressure, and um, on at least two occasions, I think I've written for him uh, on the record, that he called me in and said, would I give him a guarantee that there'd be no challenge, da da da. And I said, look, you know, I can't do that because in the end, this is a matter for our caucus, uh, not a matter for me exclusively. Uh, so it was something we were both very aware of, that there was um, a, a mounting set of questions in the party and in the caucus. I remember wow. going home and saying to the, uh, having to gather my children up who were teenagers and saying that, you know, there was a very good chance that I would be prime minister by the end of the year. And I wouldn't do it if they didn't understand the full. So Bert and I literally sat down and talked to the children through this. And that it would be the beginning of the end of my political career because you don't become leader without knowing that at some point, whether it's long or short, is an, another matter, um, that you will become leader. And then if you're sensible, at some point or other, you'll see your way out of the place. <laughs> um, so I, you know, it was fully transparent um, uh, within our family and uh, within that context. And the caucus, uh, you know, the, the, the pressure built up um, and I decided that uh, the pressure was such and, and the, the numbers were such that I took the unusual step. And this is often why it was called a coup and a surprise, uh, because I said to my, my peers, well, if we want to do this in the least disruptive way, remember where we were. We had an Asian economic crisis breathing down our neck. We had enormous fiscal pressure. Winston was very unsettled because some of the things we'd said we would do, it was clear that we were not going to be able to do as the, the financial circumstances. We were going back into um, a deficit and um, um, a recession. Well, not a, yeah, it was, I think we, we were six months. We were in a recession briefly before we pulled ourselves out of it. Uh, and so uh, an order, and Don Brash's governor of the Reserve Bank was down my neck saying, keep stability if you can, this is, we're just getting growth, da 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 da. Um, I, I printed out a, a piece of form and said on, you know, Tuesday, such and such, I'm going to challenge for the Prime Ministership. Um, you know, do you want to support me? If so, fax this back. And, um, you know, the, the, the facts are history. Uh, majority of the caucus yeah. sent this back to me. I said to Jim, look, I, I've got the written commitment. Bill Birch and he checked through their colleagues as they should do. And it became very clear to him that those numbers were there. And so the change didn't even have to go to, to the caucus the following week. Um, it was simply announced. And it, it, you know, it wasn't straightforward and it's always a very emotional and difficult uh, moment. Uh, but I made the, the decision that I would take, a, interestingly, a month because he was desperately keen to go to APEC and um, uh, that was unusual but successful for us uh, insofar as I was able to set up an office, uh, but there was continuity. It was quite dramatic at one stage because of, of the numbers. We had a very low majority 
And extraordinarily, the majority went up, which <laughs> I, I, is hard for me to explain to you all. But, um, uh, yeah. you know, as Winston left and um, part of his party split and came, I still could have gone to the election. Don Brash was saying to me, if you can avoid an election, please take that into account because it would have disrupted. Um, I was highly tempted because I had a very strong public support at that stage. However, uh, ACT came in and offered uh, confidence and supply, and I had an increased majority, not a reduced majority. It was a complex minority government and in coalition. So I managed both over less than two years, just on two years. Uh, and we got a lot done. And we turned the country around, and Helen inherited a significant surplus uh, and a growing economy again. And for me, that was success. I'd have loved another term. But I did what I intended to do. I didn't win the election. Um, but, you know, if you ask me now, do I regret? The answer is certainly not. You, you have to do what you have to do. I, I fully knew we were at the end of a nine-year cycle, and I could have waited and become the leader straight mm -hmm. after. There, there were the two choices that were clearly obvious to me um, and to the caucus. And the caucus in bulk wanted to attempt, and I was willing to have a go and see if we could pull off that change. History will record it as it is. <laughs> Easter to November seems like a long time knowing that caucus, uh, I guess, was, you know, you had, had the majority there. Why, why such, a, such a long, seemingly long delay? Uh, well, in my opinion, the government was still functioning very mm. effectively, and um, this was quite early in the term. So remember, the election had only right, been... Yeah. Um, I'm trying to think, September, October, November mm -hmm. of the year before. Uh, I was quite satisfied that we were still achieving some important results. Mm -hmm. uh, it, it certainly, um, I mean, there were several flashpoints during that period, both the leadership change and then obviously working with Winston. And, and look, we worked very well initially, but around the Wellington Airport issue uh, where he um, changed his mind and started putting our economic reputation at risk, I had to form a view on that and um, did so. Mm. That was going to say, we are both interested in, obviously Winston Peters, is, um, his reputation speaks for himself. How was that relationship? You said initially it was quite good. Did it sort of all become toxic quite quickly or like what sort of happened there? No, no, no. Look, you work with these people and you understand their differences. I, I'd been involved in the coalition agreement uh, development with Jim Bolger. There were four or five of us who'd worked with Winston and his team. So... And I'd, I'd worked right through the 90s um, in different roles with him. Um, uh, you know, Winston doesn't find working with women terribly <laughs> straightforward. Uh, but um, when he'd, look, he, he was a very successful foreign minister. When he'd done his work and he had good support, he was a very good advocate for New Zealand. But some days, you know, if he hadn't read his papers, it was always demanding. And he's, he's a politically, he's an, a political nose-driven politician. And... He decided that it was very difficult. I think he was looking for reasons uh, to get New Zealand first out of what was an increasingly demanding economic environment. Um, you know, there's a lot of detail in there we won't cover today. But I look, I respect him. Uh, I don't always agree with him, but I'm not a person who makes enemies of folk. Uh, I'm not sure that he can say that, but you know, it is what it is. Is he someone you'd have a beer with today if he rang up an office? Oh, he's he's often around here. It, it comes to the Duke quite often. We're often at functions together with he and Shane and others, and you know, we we get by. <laughs> when, when it's difficult, finds it difficult. But I'm a friend of Shane Jones and others, and. We see quite a lot of each other in different settings. MMP, MMP I guess, um, your coalition with New Zealand first, and then um, it, it was one of the sort of first elections where that you know th those dynamics had come into play. Has New Zealand realised the role of MMP? Do you think? I guess looking at Canada, where there's a bunch of larger parties mm -hmm. in New Zealand, we've sort of still got a two-party split with you know Act Greens and then New Zealand first. We, to, some would say we haven't really realised the ro true <coughs> role of MMP. Is that something that you think we should have done? We should have sort of a, a, a different party makeup in New Zealand with a bunch of different sort of medium parties. Look, it'll evolve. Um, and it has evolved. If you think where we've come from mm. to having two well-established parties around the 9 or 10% uh, and New Zealand first coming and going uh, in these things, that's a big change from where we were in the early 90s. I think that you've got to factor in that the National Party and Labour Party are far closer 
politically than many of the centre-right, centre-left mm. parties globally. You know, the Americans, are, people often compare, they sort of say, well, you know, we're, we're aligned to the Republican and Democrats. Only theoretically. I mean, we could not be more different. The mm. National Party does not resemble, thank goodness, the Republican <laughs> Party. And um, uh, those, those two big parties being in the centre, uh, I think for the foreseeable future are going to be the main course. Um, but there are changes that I think are happening. People are learning to split their votes and tactically. And I think you'll see more of that as well. Whether they fully understand the consequences of splitting the vote yeah. is not clear to me. Uh, but I think you'll see continued evolution. And even though I fought, as did Helen, for first past the post, uh, I do not think it will go back. And uh, I don't support the reducing of levels insofar as we get a plethora of smaller parties. I think the diversification of four or five parties in their volume is better than a plethora yeah of um, individual parties. You, you, you mentioned um, that you don't think the National Party, um, uh, thankfully, doesn't represent the Republican Party. I guess, were, were there, was there foreign policy decisions where uh, you, you, I guess, disagreed globally? And um, how did you balance the need for civil diplomacy with you know, having to stand up for issues on the, on the global stage and not wanting to step on, step on toes internationally? Well, New Zealand, uh, the New Zealand Parliament has had a, a fairly united foreign policy for many years. Mm. It alters on the fringe, but that's all. Um, and most of the big shifts, whether it was the anti-nuclear shift or the free trade agreements, which are geopolitical moves as well as trade moves, they, uh, we can't be naive about that. that. Uh, but they've been supported by both of the major parties in general as, as those shifts have occurred. Um, I chaired APEC, which was mm. highly complex and had, you know, the West and the East, we had East Timor, we had all sorts of layers of both geopolitical and, and trade uh, initiatives going on. The answer is leadership is critical in those moments. Uh, it didn't degenerate into, oh no, New Zealand does or does not do that. It's what is the best for New Zealand and are our peers willing to work with us? So the, the TPP mm. began at APEC in the discussions with Singapore and Chile led to the Trans-Pacific Partnership today. These things have multiple layers of political parties either um, supporting or helping them evolve uh, before they land. But that's been New Zealand's history. We do navigate pretty well for a small, agile nation. What's, what's the biggest challenge of our, of our time for New Zealand? I think, unfortunately, there's a short-term, very severe economic uh, challenge, but it's in a global context. Mm. I, I think we're heading for a recession, and I was on a major conference uh, mid last week, and uh, uh, the global consensus is there's very likely to be a global depression. Uh, that's extremely disappointing and will be much more severe in terms of its consequence. I think the challenge in that is going to be that a lot of the good intentions around climate, mm. around the transitioning to um, electric everything, may well be impacted because uh, with the uh, Ukrainian situation as well, people are forced to compromise. If, for example, the gas supplies are turned off, food production gets damaged, um, uh, you know, South Africa is desperate for Ukraine's grain. There are a series of dynamics going on which I think might be very disruptive. And New Zealand's supply chain is caught up in this, uh, which is also going to disrupt our ability to earn our foreign exchange earnings in the way in which we've historically taken for granted. Mm -hmm. So I think China is in for a major um, economic downturn. Mm -hmm. And I think there's some medium, uh, short term complexity here. The, the biggest challenge, medium term, in my opinion, is uh, getting our population growth globally under control because it's the single biggest impact on climate that occurs. Mm -hmm. All the other stuff is peripheral. When I was born in 1952, there were 3 billion people on Earth. Wow. Let me yeah. say it again for your, your cohort. <laughs> when wow. I was born in 1952, there were, actually it was just less than 3 billion people. And we're nudging eight. Mm. That's crazy. And if, in my opinion, and Helen and I have worked on this together and shared the similar view that if women worldwide were empowered and funded to be able to determine when their babies were born, uh, deliberately, it would be the single most cost-efficient action 
that you can take to then manage the impact of climate. Mm. Because all of the things we're doing on the margin, if we don't address this issue, which is a religious issue and a cultural issue, as well as a financial issue, we are blowing in the wind. And for me, I feel it very keenly because climate's critical. You know, we are in trouble here, but we're putting a strain on the globe through footprints and our, our consequential behaviour, needing to be fair, needing to enjoy our excesses. So I want the discourse around climate to change. I want uh, to broaden the discussion so that we actually can have this addressed. You cannot today get population discussed at the UN because of the offence it causes uh. to the Catholic uh, nations. Now, I don't find that acceptable. I think that we have to call this stuff out, and until we do, I'm highly sceptical about people's intentions to address these catastrophic issues. How do you go about addressing that? Because obviously that's, a, like, <clears throat> from, I don't, I'm not religious at all, but I've always found that like the religious stuff's been almost like taboo to talk about, very hard to engage with. How do you address Well, it's, it? it's very difficult, but we are going to have to have leaders that put this elephant in the room. And until the Pope addresses both, both um, I think the abuse thinks it's right beside this, by the way, I think that celibacy and these notions that were well-intentioned and telling women how they can and can't have their babies is just completely and utterly ridiculous insofar as the consequences of not allowing these things to occur are completely visible. I mean, how can't people see that 5 billion extra people over 60 years isn't causing an overweighted catastrophe? Mm. It is. Yeah. And I just don't hear people saying it enough. So if you ask me <laughs> what is the critical question, you know, la language around climate and food, and these are unintended consequences of a population explosion, which is then complicated by aging populations in some countries, mm. including our own. So it's not straightforward. But it's if you ask me the question, that's what I would say right now, that we have to put this front and centre on the political agenda. And, and to finish, what's a policy that you're most proud of looking back at your career to today? There's not a single one I would want to choose, uh, but I think that New Zealand's a much better place uh, than it was. Mm. Uh, the, the three things I would say is that some of the very big changes we made in the early 90s give us the choices that we have today. I mean, we were at 51% debt mm. uh, in terms of our economy. And it, it, well, some of the largest expenditure annually was, annually was debt servicing. Mm. It's an absurd position to be. And we took some tough calls that got us back where we could invest in opportunity. And so I think that suite of policies, as difficult as they were, I think has allowed the New Zealand we right. see today to be visible. Some of the things I, we did for women, I, I'm happy to have my record on uh, women's emancipation tested against anyone else. Cervical screening, breast screening, after school care, mm. introducing childcare, all of these things were national led issues. And I'm, 1993 Human Rights Act changes were work we did, uh, insisting that retired women were treated independently, not as a chattel of their husband. Uh, you know, th these were massive social changes that I'm very proud of that are part of our team and probably the, the, the Maori issues. Uh. I mean, we will not be who we are or can be until we are very comfortable uh, being a place that uh, is a shared society where we value and respect difference. And that's gender as well as our very rich and important ethnic population. And I live it every day here. <laughs> I look across to Waitangi. Mm. And I also can see Maiki Hill. And Maiki Hill is, uh, we were all taught as children that Hone Heke chopped the flagstaff down. But we were rarely told that Maori then reinstated that flagstaff mm. in 1858 as an action of reconciliation. And I think that concept of how do we make this work? Mm. How lucky are we to have a treaty? And if we can make it work, then I think we can be very optimistic. My personal hope is that by 2040, which is only 18 years away, uh, a lot of the things that have begun by both political parties uh, will be far further forward. And the equity that we spoke about earlier uh, will be more visible around both the equity of opportunity, but also of outcome. And I actually see big progress being made there, which excites me. 
Awesome. Well, I think some optimism is a great note to finish it. Thanks very much for your Thank time. Thank you very much. And, my pleasure. Really and good luck it. with your work. It's, um, it's exciting that intergenerationally these voices can be heard so that at least they create a perspective.